Matthew, the 17th chapter, in verse 25, this is one of several occasions where Jesus wanted his disciples or someone in his audience to do some thinking and reflecting on a question, and so he would proceed that question with the phrase, What do you think? He says here to Peter, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes from the sons or from strangers? He's wanting Simon to think a little bit. What do you think, Simon? Go to the next chapter, chapter 18, and in verse 12, he raises again a question about if, if there are a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he leave the ninety and nine and go to the mountain to seek the one that was straying? You know the question. But he started it with, what do you think? What do you think? I want you to think. What are you thinking? Well, in the 21st chapter, in verse 28, again, here's a man who had two sons, and he said, the first go work today in my vineyard, and you know the rest of the story, but he preceded that by asking, what do you think? That question, what do you think, is a good question, isn't it? That's a very good question. We ask that all the time. We state something, and we turn to someone and say, what do you think? And so the question is, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? What is on your mind? You see, what I'm learning from this, and we're going to see from other passages, it's not just outward actions and words that matter, but even our thoughts matter. It is a given that our outward actions matter. What I do, if it's contrary to the will of God, is, is something that matters. If I'm doing what's right, that matters. If I say things contrary to God, say things that are ugly, use foul language, that matters. But does it matter what I think? Are my thoughts that important? So tonight, let's talk about what do you think? What do you think? That was a good question. Jesus raised that question. What do you think? We're going to notice four things. Here's the first. I want us to see a connection between thinking and the real person. There is a very close connection between your thinking and the real you. In fact, that is the real you. Here's what we mean by that. We often don't want to reveal our real thoughts. We may be thinking something, but we don't want those around us to know what we're thinking, perhaps for obvious reasons. We may even try to give an impression that's different from what we really think. So we have a thought on our mind, but we don't want everybody around to know what we're thinking, so we try to give an impression that's contrary to that. Our words and our actions may not agree with the real thought that's in our minds. We'll give evidence of that here in a moment. Let's turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, and I want us to suggest from that passage that if we could read one's mind, we see the real person. You see what they're doing, you see what they're saying, but you can't read their minds. But what if you could read someone's mind? And let's just suppose for illustration's sake that while somebody is saying something and somebody's acting out, you have a special power so that you could look right above their head and you see this, this thought that's going on above them and you're reading their minds. If you could do that, you see the real person. And why do I say that? Let's go to this text in Proverbs. Do not eat the bread of miser. You, you hear this passage, it's in red here, quoted, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Usually out of its context is where we quote that. So let's put it back in its context and make some sense. He's talking about eating the bread of a miser. Do not eat the bread of a miser, nor desire his delicacies. Why? For, here's the reason, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. The morsel you have eaten, you will vomit up and waste your pleasant words. Now let's analyze that. The miser comes to you. Who's a miser? A miser is a tightwad. He's, he's a guy who's offering, he's, he's putting on a front that's not him. So the miser says to you, he says, don't desire his delicacies, for he, what he thinks in his heart, so is he. In other words, what he's thinking is the real man. But notice now the next phrase, eat and drink, he says. What he says is not what he's thinking. What he says gives a good impression. What he's thinking is, I hope you don't eat my food. I hope you don't take me up on my offer. 
I hope you will leave most of the food or all of it for me. He's a miser. He's a tightwad, isn't he? But he says to you, eat, eat. I want you to eat. Or he takes you out to eat and says, order anything you want. Price, it doesn't matter. Order anything on the menu. I want you to get what you want. But he's thinking in himself, I hope you don't order anything. Maybe order some water. That won't cost us anything. So what he says is not what he's thinking, but he's trying to give a good impression. But, in it, but his heart is not with you. In other words, his words and his actions are not sincere. He says, eat, eat, but he's not sincere in that. He doesn't want you to eat. So when you find out his real person, verse 8 says, the more so you have eaten, you will vomit up. When you know what he really thinks, you're very disappointed. If we were to find out what's on your mind and what you're thinking, would we be disappointed? And if you were to find out what's really on my mind when I'm talking to you, would you be disappointed? This passage says the real person is what's going on in his mind and what he's thinking. Now let's give some examples of that. On the one side, we have our words and our actions. On the other side is what we might be thinking. For example, we may say to someone, good to see you. We run into them in the store and we say, it's so good to see you. But when you saw them before you spoke, you thought, oh great, it's her again. We see what you think is the real person. Now, in every one of these examples, there may be hypocrisy. In all of these examples, there may be dishonesty. That may be need to dealt with, but that's not my concern tonight. My concern is what they're thinking is the real person. Or it may be you say to someone, good job on what you just did. But you're thinking, what a mess. That's the real person. You say to someone who's just served you a meal, what a great meal, but you're thinking, this is the worst stuff I've ever tasted. What you're thinking is the real person. That's what I want us to see. Or you go out to eat with someone and you say, let me pay for that. But you're thinking, I hope he doesn't take me up on that because I don't want to pay. And someone says to you, we love you, and you say, we love you all too. But you're thinking, I can't stand them. You say, there's hypocrisy. Oh, yeah. You say, well, that's dishonest. Oh, yes. But I'm not concerned tonight about that. What I'm concerned about is establishing the point. What goes in on in our mind is the real person. Whatever you're thinking, the thoughts going through your mind is the real person. That's Proverbs chapter 23. Perhaps you've heard the story of the little girl that was standing on the sofa. And her mother says to her, sit down. And she doesn't do it. So her mother says, sit down, and I mean it. And she doesn't do it. Her mother then spanks her and forces her to sit down. And then the mother says to her, now what do you think of that? And the little girl says, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm still standing up on the inside. You see, what's in the heart is the real person. So my question to you tonight is, what do you think? What you're thinking is the real person. Here's the second thing. Let's talk about thinking and sin. There is a connection between thinking and sin. How so? Well, there's two things I want you to consider with me. First of all, I want us to consider that thinking can be sinful within itself. That is, there are some thoughts you will have or could have or may be having that the thought itself is sinful. It doesn't have to make you act on anything. Just the thinking itself is sinful. There is such a thing as sinful thought. Let's go to the book of Proverbs, if you will. Proverbs 15 and in verse 26. The proverb writer talks about the thoughts of the wicked. Now, the wicked people have thoughts, just like righteous people have thoughts. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. Even their thoughts are an abomination. There's some things they're thinking that are just wrong within themselves. You remember in the story of the flood, Genesis chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9, in chapter 8, God made the point that man's heart is on, his imaginations are evil, on evil continually. In other words, he imagines evil. He thinks up evil. He anticipates doing evil. His thought process is evil within itself. I want to suggest to you that the catalogs of sin, those passages that we would list as catalogs of sin, list a number of sins that are overt acts, adultery, fornication, murder, stealing, 
But there is also in the middle of those catalogs a number of things that involve thoughts. Let's list it some, look at some of those catalogs. Romans 1, for example. Romans 1 is a list of the sins of the Gentile world. The pagans, the unbelievers, the atheists have no use for God. Some of the sins that are listed are sins of thought. For example, there is vile passion, Romans 1, 26. There is covetousness, that's a thought process. Maliciousness, hatred in other words, verse 29. Envy, verse 29. Unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, verse 31. Every one of those couched right in the middle of other overt acts are sins of thought. Could I be thinking of things that are sinful within themselves, like I'm hating someone, or maybe I am covetous, or there's vile passion, or I'm unloving or unmerciful? Let's go to another catalog. Galatians 5. You remember Galatians 5, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, and there's adultery, fornication, murder, etc. Host of things that are terrible and horrible, but couched right in the middle of that is this list. What do we have? There's hatred, verse 20, jealousies, verse 20. Selfish ambition, verse 20, and envy. Every one of those are thoughts. We can sin in our thoughts. Let's go to another catalog. Let's go this time to Colossians 3. Colossians 3 talks about putting off the things. And here's some things we're to put aside and put to death. Now there's some other sins listed there, but these are all sins of thought like passion, verse 5. Evil desire, verse 5. Covetousness, verse 5. Anger and wrath and malice. These are evil things. We can sin even in our thoughts. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. We were there in the Sermon on the Mount this morning. And in that Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about worldliness or materialism. But one of the things he addresses, beginning at verse 24, is again our thinking process. Materialism is a thought process. It could lead to us maybe stealing. But when he talks about worry within itself, and this is in the context of materialism, of thinking on material things, and our focus primarily on material things, notice beginning at verse, I said verse 24, verse 25, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, or about your body, what you'll put on. And it goes on down the line. You know the story. Here's the point. When one is worrying, what they're doing is their thinking process. Worrying may not lead to overt acts. It could, but it may not. I can just be worrying about the food and the clothing and the shelter. And where's the next meal going to come? How am I going to take it? How am I going to pay my bills? And I'm worried. That's materialism. It goes on right here in the mind. Philippians 4 verse 6 says essentially the same thing. Here's the second part of thinking in sin. There is thinking that may not be sinful within itself that leads to sin. So there is the connection between our thinking and sin. How does this work? Well, I want you to see that actions are driven by our thinking. Let's go to the book of Proverbs. Here's another familiar proverb. We've cited one that's one of the most familiar earlier. Let's go to Proverbs, the fourth division, and in verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. What's he saying? Keep your heart and your thoughts and your mind pure, for out of your mind spring the issues of life. You function, your actions... Your outward behavior comes from your thinking. So it could be that my thinking leads me to sin because my actions are driven by my thinking. Let's go to Matthew 15. Matthew chapter 15, if you will, beginning at verse 19. Matthew 15 and verse 19. This is where Jesus says, For out of the heart, For out of the heart, that is out of the mind, out of your thinking, or from your thought process, proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adultery, fornication, thefts, and false witness, and blasphemies. All of this comes from our thinking process. And so we could be led to sin through our thoughts. Let me give you some examples of that. Let's take David. Let's go back to 2 Samuel. You know the sin of David in 2 Samuel chapter 11. He committed the sin with Bathsheba. That was an overt act. It's a sin of fornication, sin of adultery. But what I want you to notice is that it was his thoughts that had he stopped with the thinking, it would have never led to the action. How so? Let's notice beginning at verse 2. 2 Samuel 11 in verse 2, It happened one evening when David rose from his bed and walked on the roof of the house. And from the house, are you reading with me now? 
He saw a woman bathing enter the thought into his mind. And the woman he saw was very beautiful to behold. He continues to think about what he saw. Now David could have stopped it at that point and said, I don't need to see that. I don't need to look at that. As she's bathing, but I need to turn around and go inside. So David now acts on his thoughts. So David went and inquired about the woman. And someone said, that's Bathsheba. Now verse 4, David sent messengers and took her and she came to him and he lay with her. He never reached the point of fornication until first of all he started thinking about the sin of fornication. That's the point I want you to see. Let's take another case, the case of Achan and Joshua 7. You remember they took the city of Jericho in the conquest and the next attempt they made was at Ai and it didn't go too well because someone had committed a sin and had taken of the accursed thing. They're taken of the spoils. They shouldn't have done that. So at verse 21, when they finally narrow it down and find out that Achan is the man, he's, here's his defense or here's what he says. He said, I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. Enter the thought. I coveted. That was his thought. Them and I took them. He never would have taken them had he not thought about it first. So what we're seeing is the thought leads to action. I want to suggest from 1 John chapter 2, you're familiar with that text, that all temptation begins with the thinking. All temptation, it doesn't matter what it is. We are tempted through the lust of the flesh. That causes me to think about what I want to do. I'm thinking about that because it's a lust of the flesh. I am tempted through the lust of the eye. I'm thinking now about what I want to see, like David, or maybe like Achan. There is the pride of life. I'm thinking about myself. So each of the avenues of sin, you're tempted in one of those three avenues, is a matter of focusing on our thought process. I think about what I want to think about, what I want to see, and I'm thinking about myself. All temptation begins with our thought. I want to suggest to you not only all temptation, but every sin begins with the thinking process. You just name the sin, and no one has ever committed it until, first of all, they thought about it. You don't steal, and then you think, you know what? I guess I should have been stealing. You think about stealing before you ever steal. The same thing with murder, the same thing with adultery, the same thing with cursing or slander or forsaking prayer or forsaking worship. Every sin that's committed begins first with a thinking process. It begins in the mind, and then we act upon the thought. Here's the third thing. We see thinking in the real person, thinking in sin. Let's talk about thinking and change. Thinking and change. What are we talking about? Well, the need for a change in our thinking is that God knows even our thoughts. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it can divide, the text says, and discern even the thoughts of the heart. So God, through His Word and the revealing of His Word, He can discern the very thoughts of our heart. Even the secrets of man are open before Him, Revelation chapter, or Romans chapter 2 and in verse 16. So I need to change my thinking if it isn't what it should be because God knows my thoughts. Others may not. Now let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and in verse 5. And as you're turning there, let me suggest to you that quite often we have this concept that you know what, I can control my words, but I can't help what I think. I can control my actions, but I tell you what, I, I just can't help what I think. I, I have thoughts pop in my mind and I cannot control, I can't help what I think. And yet 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 says that we should in our battle cast down the arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against Christ, bringing, are you reading with me now, every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We're to take even every thought and submit it to the Lord Jesus Christ. That means I can and I must control my thinking. We can do that. Now here's some thinking that we must change. Some thinking just must, must be changed. How so? Well, the righteous, the unrighteous man 
in Isaiah 55, that great invitation. Let's turn back over to Isaiah 55. The unrighteous man, the text says, is to forsake his thoughts. In other words, turn from them. This is a description of repentance. And notice what he says at verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. You see, when I come to recognize my thoughts are not what they should be, I need to forsake them. I need to push them aside. I can get rid of those. Go to Acts chapter 8 and verse 22. You remember the case of Simon where he offered by the Holy Spirit with money? That was a thinking process for him. He saw the gift of the Holy Spirit and he wanted that and he offered money for it. He was thinking. Now he did have an overt act of offering, but he was thinking something. And Peter told him to repent therefore of this thy wickedness if perhaps the thought of your heart be forgiven you. Sometimes we need to be given, forgiven of our thoughts. And so what I'm learning from Acts is we need to repent and be forgiven of our thoughts. We need to be forgiven of those thoughts that are not right in the sight of God. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5. Repentance starts with remembering. Sin starts with our thought process, but so does repentance start there. Remember, therefore, from whence you have fallen and repent and do your first work. Remember. In other words, when you've done what's wrong, you need to remember what you used to be and repent and return to where you used to be. So what I'm suggesting to you is that repentance starts with remembering. Remembering what's right, remembering what you used to be, remember where you left. Remember where you turned aside. We need to change our life with a new way of thinking. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12 says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed. In other words, don't let the world mold you and shape you to be just like it, but be different, be transformed, be changed. How are you going to do that, Paul? By the renewing of your mind. That's a new way of thinking. I like the New Century Version here. Do not be shaped by this world. Instead, be changed within by a new way of thinking. See, you can change your whole course of life with a new way of thinking. You just think different. And so there has to be a change of thinking. Now I want to suggest to you that sin can be stopped by stopping the thinking. If my thought that is wrong leads me to sin, if I stop the thinking process, I can stop the sin. Let me illustrate with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul tells us that fornication ought to cease, it ought to end, it ought to be stopped. It ought to be prevented. And he tells us how. Let's read. Beginning at verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. He doesn't stop there, though. In other words, don't commit the sin of fornication. Paul, can you help us to understand how we can do that? All right. Verse 4. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Control your body. Paul, you want to tell me how I could do that? Verse 5, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Here's what he just said. Don't commit the sin of fornication, but don't wait till you're nearly to the point of committing fornication before you stop. You can back up and control your body so that it doesn't lead to the sin of fornication. But how do I do that, Paul? You control your thoughts, not in passion of lust. If you control your thoughts, that controls your body and that presents the sin of fornication. That's his, that's his point. That's his argument. Albert Einstein said, the problems we face today cannot be solved on the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. He's exactly right. Because that's what Peter is saying in Acts 8. It's what the prophet is saying in Isaiah 55. Change your way of thinking. That's what Paul is saying in Romans 12. The problems we create cannot be solved on the same level of the thought process that we were using when we created the problem. You've got to change your thinking before we can change our lives. Let's talk about thinking and a better life finally. Every Christian present, I'm sure, would agree if I were to ask for a show of hands, how many want a better life? And you may think your life is great now, great. But how would you like for your life to be even better? And I think everyone would raise their hand.
Well, that begins with the thinking process. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We ought to strive to be mature in our thinking. To be mature in our thinking. And I understand as you turn there and you say, well, I think in 1 Corinthians 13 talking about love. Yeah, it is. He said, but, but I think also in that, in that context talking about the duration of spiritual gifts, and it is. But he gives an illustration in the middle of that. And that's what I want us to see. Notice he says at verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, and thought as a child. He's talking about the, the development of the word, and that is the word was in part and then it's complete. That's the context. I understand that, and you do too. That which is not complete and that which is complete. But he illustrates it with a child. And when, when one is a child, here's how they behave, but then they mature. Notice what he says at verse 11. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Well, how was it when you were a child? Well, he said, I, uh, I spoke like a child. I talked like a child. I talked baby talk. I said immature things. What else did you do when you were a child? Well, I understood as a child. I didn't have clear and good understanding. So it was like a child. Well, what else did you do as a child? I thought as a child. My thinking was immature. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So the idea of striving to be mature in our thinking involves putting away childish or immature thinking. C could it be that some of the things and thoughts that we have are immature thoughts, that are more childish talk, thoughts, that are more immature thoughts, that are more on the level of a newborn babe than one who's been a Christian a long time. And so if you begin to look at things, you say, you know what, that's like talking baby talk when you're a teenager, it's time to quit that, you're grown up now. The same thing is true with our thinking. If our thinking is immature, it's time to grow. Put away that immature thinking. You see, the thoughts of the righteous are going to be different. You remember a moment ago we looked at a passage that talked about the thoughts of the wicked. Let's go back to the book of Proverbs again. Proverbs 12 and in verse 5. And what I want you to see is the thoughts of the righteous, the mature in this context that we're talking about, are going to be different. He said the thought of the righteous are right, but the counsel of the wicked are deceitful. The wicked think different, but the thoughts of the righteous, the thoughts of the mature are different. Let's go to a familiar passage, Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 8. We need to think on good things in order to be a better servant. You're familiar with this passage. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there are any virtue, if there are any praise, Meditate, or the King James says, think on these things. What's that saying? He lists a whole list of things. Well, let's go back over the list. Things that are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report. He said, think on these things. It is not just thinking for the sake of thinking good. So how can I fulfill this passage? Well, it's not that you're going to be sitting off in the recliner and your husband or wife or your parents say, what are you thinking? Well, I'm just thinking of good things. What are you going to do? Well, I'm just thinking of <laughs> Thinking of pure today. And the next day, what are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking of just, things that are just. You don't think just for the sake of thinking, but it is the idea of you think about qual good qualities in view of becoming those. In other words, you're contemplating how can I be what this text says. Let's go back through the list now. Whatever things are just and whatever things are pure, I need to think on things that are pure in view of becoming more like that. How can I achieve that goal? So what am I doing today that may be against that goal of purity? And uh, how can I achieve more purity and greater purity? Or maybe it's the matter of being fair and just. Am I being fair and just? How can I be more just and how can I be more fair? How can I be more level-headed in dealing with people? And how can I achieve that goal? So we need to think of good in view of becoming that. The Bible repeatedly encourages meditation. Let's go to Psalm 1 in verse 1 and 2. The first Psalm talks about meditation in verse 2 particularly. 
His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Meditation has to do with thinking. The footnote, by the way, the footnote in your text, if you have the New King James, will say something like, ponders by talking to himself. He's doing some thinking. He takes the word and he meditates. It's like he's talking to himself. What does that mean? How can I apply that? How can I do that better? How? He's contemplating, he's thinking, he's meditating. Here's another passage. Psalm 19 in verse 14. Psalm 19 in verse 14. We see this idea of meditation once again. Verse 14 said, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Let the meditation of my heart be acceptable. Let the thoughts of my heart be acceptable to you. Holiday, Hebrew lexicon says, it means thinking or planning. Let my thinking or my planning be acceptable in your sight. Let's go back to the fourth psalm. Back up a little bit to the fourth psalm in verse 4. Psalm 4 and in verse 4. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. The point is do some serious thinking. Meditate on your bed. You're doing some serious thinking. Some serious meditation. The 119th Psalm, numerous times, and I'll just give a sampling of this in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 48. I will meditate on your statutes. Verse 15, I skip back up to verse 15. I will meditate on your precepts. Verse 97, I will meditate on your law. And verse 99, that your testimonies are my meditation. In other words, we should meditate on the word. Let's close by dealing with the idea of positive thinking. We're talking about thinking for a better life. When we talk about positive thinking, we're not talking about the positive mental attitude concept where you don't think about bad things, you don't think about sin, and you don't think about dangers. We're to only think about positive things. There's nothing wholesome within that concept within itself. But here's the idea. But I need to have the thought of Philippians 4.13. I can do whatever God expects of me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is not a PMA me message. It is a message that I can do whatever God expects me to do. Whatever command he gives, I can obey it. Whatever trial is before me, I can endure it. Whatever circumstance, I can live through that. That's positive thinking. Like the two, the Joshua and Caleb, who had positive attitude about conquering the land, we see potential, we see possibilities. Rather than seeing obstacles, we see possibilities. I can do that. I can achieve that. I can do better. I can grow. I can improve in the kingdom. That's positive thinking. What do you think? What do you think? That's how Jesus raised a question and then had people to ponder and think about that. And so I ask you, what do you think? Thinking and the real person. Thinking and sin. Thinking and change. And thinking and the better life. There may be one or more present this evening who's not a Christian, who's not a child of God. If you come this evening believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and while we sing?